Welcome to section two of chapter 21. And in this chapter, we're going to be going over the empires of South America, and we're going to focus mostly on the Inca. So starting off with section two, one of the things to understand about South America is that we don't have any writing. So all the writing that exists from South America in terms of historical writings are written post-conquest. So similar to what I talked about in the previous chapter, a lot of it is done under the supervision of the Spaniards. The people of South America didn't have writing. So whereas in the Aztec and Mayan civilizations, you've seen the destruction of texts, there were no texts to destroy in South America. They didn't have writing. They did develop another system of record keeping called the Quipu system that we'll talk about in a, in a little bit. So we're going to look at how South America eventually saw the rise of the Incas, who go on to build uh, the largest empire in South America. So the Andes region, which you see here in green in this map, right, is very mountainous. So you have the coasts, and um, a lot of the coast is actually hot because of the latitude. It's close to the equator. So like the Atacama Desert is actually the driest desert in the world. And then the mountains really go shoot up to over 20,000 feet. So it's a very mountainous, very rugged terrain. So it's very hard to develop a large, flat, you know, place of urbanized landscapes, at, at least in this time. And then a, a big chunk that you see there in South America is actually um, rainforest. So it's very hard to, um, to have, again, a large civilization where it rains too much because then too much rain leaches the soil, so you can't really have a lot of farming. So there were states that emerged, and two of the, the states that had emerged before the Inca were the Chiquito and the Chimu kingdoms that both were built up in the, in the highlands of the Andes, and they would communicate with the people down more towards the coastal region. They would engage with trade with them, but they would build their societies using the lakes and the irrigation from the running water coming down from the snow mountain, from the mountains. And so Chiquito um, dominated the area around Lake Titicaca, which is between modern day Peru and Bolivia. And they built their society based on, you know, agriculture like all the other empires. And the cultivation of potatoes and the herding of alpacas was important for their civilization. So the main staple crop of Mesoamerica was maize, but in the Andean South America, we're going to see the potato be the staple crop. And then also, they don't have large animals. So something I, I didn't mention in the previous lecture is in the Americas, there are no, there were no, before the arrival of Spaniards, there were no large beasts of burden. There were no animals that can do labor the way horses and ox could in the Eastern Hemisphere. There were no cows, there were no sheep, there were no pigs. So llamas and alpacas in South America were actually the largest domesticated animals, but they're not very good for doing work. However, they did use them for their wool um, and to lightly carry. And if that picture at the bottom there looks kind of uh, funny to some of you, that is because this is a building that represents an old Chiquito uh, temple of fertility. And so you see a lot of um, phallic symbols in some of the South American cultures. And even in Aztec society, there was a lot of sculptures that were very um, phallic because fertility is very important. And so fertility is represented with the male organ. Um, and the reason it's significant is because of the fertilization of the land. And so, so a lot of what people believed in what was important had to do with the fertility of the soil because without agriculture, you do not eat, you do not survive. And then another important kingdom was the Chimu kingdom. And the Chimu kingdom thrived and it dominated around the Peruvian coast for about uh, a little over 100 years before the Inca arrived. So you had the lowlands, you had the Chimu, and then up high in the highlands, you had the Chiquito, and they communicated through each other with roads that were built going up and down the mountains. And so for a few hundred centuries, these states kind of maintain order. But within a period of about 30 years, they fell under the control of the Inca. And so the Inca built their empire really quickly through military expansion started by the Emperor Pachacuti. Um, Inca referred to, that was the title of the emperor. The, his title was the Inca. 
So the Inca referred to the ruler, and then now they use it to refer to them as the Inca Empire, the Incans. So they had settled around Lake Titicaca, and under Pachacuti, he begins to extend his authority. He begins to control the water that the, that, um, the Chimu had needed to irrigate. So because the Inca were higher up, if you control the water that goes downstream, then you kind of force the people downstream to do what you want. They extended all the way down to parts of Argentina and then all the way up to Peru. So they didn't have a large population, so they started by controlling people, by, you know, taking um, people from one town. If, if you didn't obey them, they would take you and they would relocate you to a very far part of the empire. Um, so they used, you know, it was military based. Everything was considered to be owned by the Inca. So this was also a very centralized empire where the emperor owned everything technically. So everyone that operated was operating under the permission of the Inca. So they did have a system of record keeping and this is the Kipu system. They kept track of population through censuses using a series of corded knots using different colors of cords and different systems of knots to both the names of the people from certain towns and um, how many people. They also were used to, um, you know, how, you know, have you paid your taxes? Have you served? And this was important because the Inca had a system called the Mita system. And the Mita system was when the government forced you to go work a certain amount of time. And that was dependent on how large your town was. So if they went to your town, they had to know how many people, how many males, how many females, and if they have already paid their service, their mita. Um, so that's that's the kipu system that was used. So this is another form of record keeping, and this is evidence that just because you don't have writing doesn't mean you don't have a sophisticated system of record keeping. They knew how to use this, you know. And it's actually, it was mysterious until very recently, a student a couple of years ago, this young man here, Manny Medrano, he kind of cracked the code. He started comparing quipu that were made after the arrival of the Spaniards with Spaniard census documents and started realizing that the colors and the knots not only represent the number, but also the names of people. He looked at the different colors and you begin to match how many people with this name, how many people with that name, matched exactly with the cords of the quipu from those census counts. So this young man kind of cracked the code and ended up changing his major to archaeology, but used a lot of his math background to kind of figure out how these systems were used. The capital was in Cusco, and this is a little bit outside of Cusco. This is actually going up to Machu Picchu, but Cusco was the Inca capital, and Cusco served as an administrative and a religious center. So it's important to understand the very the commonality, right? Throughout cities everywhere that we've been looking at, they are used as religious, ceremonial, and administrative center. So they kind of serve the same purpose. This is the home of the royal family of a lot of the powerful nobles that are living here, and that's where a lot of the trade is happening. One of the biggest accomplishments of the Inca was their elaborate road system. The Incas built over 16,000 kilometers of road, and they linked their roads all the way up north from Quito, all the way down south past Santiago, which is in today Chile, and then going up and down the mountains. So these roads are used as a way of centralizing government. Okay, By having a very effective system of roads, you could communicate a part, you know, a region that's very hard to communicate. You know, it's very, this mountainous terrain is very rugged and very hard to get through, but by building roads and, and reinforcing them with stone, building bridges over these deep valleys is going to cut down travel time. And like the emperor in Tenochtitlan, the Inca, if he wanted fresh fish from the coast, he could have it every day because they would use a system of runners. And this same system existed throughout Mesoamerica as well. They had people that you run for 20, 30, 40 miles, and then you go to a station and you pass off the message or you pass off the, in this case, a basket that was woven to be watertight with fish. They would run another 30, 40 miles, hand it off to someone else who would run another 30, 40 miles. And they were, they would communicate messages within a, within a matter of days throughout the entire empire. 
So these system of roads still exist today, and um, they, there are some places that still use the original Inca roads in terms of, you know, communicating between villages, but also when they started to build highways, right, they used the routes of some of these Inca roads. So that helped the Inca administer their empire and build a centralized empire. They also controlled trade. They didn't allow a merchant class to emerge. Because everything was considered to be owned by the Inca, by the ruler, um, you weren't allowed to be a merchant on your own. People locally made stuff, right? Made arts and crafts and, and pottery and clothing that they would trade locally. But to engage in long distance trade, it was done under the control of the government. So the upper class was made up of the ruling elites. And these were the people that were distinguished by the way they dressed and by uh, being able to wear these giant rings in their earlobes. So at the top, you had the aristocrats and the priests, right, who carry out the rituals. Again, agriculture is very important. And we're going to see that when we get to religion. So the aristocrats and the priests were the upper classes and then followed by the peasants. The peasants had to cultivate the land. They didn't own the land, but they lived in small groups where the where the government allowed you to have access to a certain parcel of land. Um, this is similar to what the Aztecs had. The Aztecs called them calpulis, and the Inca called them uh, ayu, ay, or ailu. And these were kind of like what in Mexico they call ejidos, right? They're communal lands where everybody there kind of works that land. But in addition to working that land, everyone then has to also provide service. Men have to go build roads, build bridges, uh, fix irrigation canals. Women had to provide textiles, pottery, and jewelry to the government as a form of a labor tax. And then when we look at religion, again, agricultural societies are going to venerate agricultural nature spirits. And so in this case, Inti and Viracocha were two of the main Inca deities. And Inti represents the sun and Viracocha, the creator of the world. So they also um, found the moon, the stars, the planets, the rain, and other natural forces as divine. And this is important because the societies are living off agriculture. Because you are living off of agriculture, you really need to understand the movement of the planets, the stars, so you know when to plant when to harvest. And this is why, you know, the people of the Americas and, and uh, the Mayans, the Olmec, developed very sophisticated and advanced calendar systems. It was because of their knowledge of the stars and the moon. And so when the Spaniards arrived, they misinterpret that as to be gods, but that's because these were important concepts that you needed to understand in order to make sure your calendars are accurate. The, the people of the Americas had calculated the leap year. They understood that every four years, we fall behind a day. And that's very important when you're planting to make sure that you're planting at the right time. So that was it for section two. And section three, I'm not gonna go over um, too much. It's a very short section. And what is just important to understand is that there was also societies that were developed in the Pacific, in the South Pacific, and in Australia, so the region is known as, they call it Oceania. And even though Australia, you can see on the map, is very close to the Philippines and, and it's very close to the trade routes that communicated China with the Indian Ocean, Australia was never settled by people other than the Aboriginal Australian people. It was never engaged in trade with Afro-Eurasia and it didn't develop agriculture. Um, because it, agriculture in the in the Pacific Islands spreads through diffusion. People learned it from people that went to these islands and had crossed over land bridges when the sea levels were were lower. So the people of uh, Papua New Guinea, they had developed an agricultural society, but Australia remained hunter-gatherer until the arrival of Europeans in the 1800s. But seafaring people, were able to colonize the entire South Pacific, Melanesia, Micronesia, Samoa, Fiji, Tahiti, all the way out to Easter Island, and then all the way out to the Hawaiian Islands. So, so all of this was cultivated. People spread there, and they took with them plants. So when you see Hawaii and you see these, these very tropical Hawaiian plants, none of that is originally native to Hawaii. Because if you think about it, Hawaii can, comes from volcanic islands. And 
volcanic ash doesn't have any flowers. So the, the, the settlers who first went to Hawaii had taken plants and cultivated that with them. So under, just understand uh, that aspect of, of Section 3, okay? How seafaring people are able to colonize the islands all around the, the Pacific, the South Pacific, and, you know, possibly also reach the Americas just the way the, um, the Vikings reached the Americas. If people did reach the Americas through South America, because Easter Island isn't too far, too far off, um, there was never any long sustained contact. So if people ever did communicate or, or land there, it didn't establish any contact long enough to be significant. Okay, so just understand that aspect of Section 3. All right, and any questions, again, ask them in class, and I will see you there.